Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming today. Uh, but we're Debbie Stone and A. I'm Shirley. This is Paul. Uh, this is Sue. And today we're really here to present you about maximizing student engagement in the classroom. So what's the plan for today? So really today we're aiming to explore three uh, main things. So explore a little bit of the student engagement, uh, the context, the definitions, the policy. Uh, try to understand a little bit of the main theoretical perspective, um, again, surrounding engagement. And then trying to uh, put a bit more hands on the tools and techniques that we can all use to uh, increase uh, student engagement. Discuss as well the, the merits and the challenges uh, that obviously we're faced with the different teaching approaches that we might engage. Uh, do a bit of reflection as well into the, the practice and also the importance of engagement. Uh, and then just uh, conclude with some final remarks. So hopefully by the end of the session, as you've probably seen from the creativity that we put online, um, we aim that by the end you'll be able to define student engagement, uh, that again you're going to have a general understanding on the theories of engagement, uh, and then of course that you um, take on some practical tools to enhance your teaching and enhancement practices, and of course reflection on their engagement practices. Now before I pass it on to Sue who's going to be discussing a bit more on the definition and the context of engagement, um, I want you to start, um, if we could do two groups, and then start just brainstorming about the best and the worst student engagement experience. So you guys don't mind being group A, focusing on the teacher perspective, and you guys in the back on the student perspective. Have a quick chat, two, three minutes, about the best and the worst experience that you've had, um, whether it is as a teacher, or whether it is as a student. Um, and then you can just choose one of each, on the best and the worst, um, and then we're just going to get all together, have a quick chat, um, and you can explain the reason why as well. That would be great. So there you go. Two, three minutes if you have a good job. Yeah, that's a challenge. Okay, thank you. What about you guys? 
referring to the fact of a best or worst experience in your position? It has a positive experience. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Go for it. Um, it was in, in effect interactive learning. We were looking at honey month and, and learning styles and we calculated exactly what are uh, whether reflective or active or that sort of stuff. Um, and we ended up with dividing the room into four quarters and calculating and standing in the room where our learning style was so we could actually think about how the class had separated out and, and how different people had different needs and requirements. Okay, so kind of an active set, a very a active, but active, but applying the theory as well. Okay, brilliant. Anything worse that you guys could think of? Statistics. statistics. <laughs> just, just in general. We got worse and best statistics. Yes, <laughs> yes that's the best. And why is it the best and the worst then? Uh, so I was saying that in my undergraduate, my favourite subject was statistics because the lecture was very engaging and was using examples from newspapers, for example, to make it more real. And it really has stayed with me until now. But there were two people that were saying that statistics was the the worst module about your lecture. I lectured undergraduate level. He did more look at the class. He looked at the ceiling, the wall, the back wall. Uh, he gave out notes which he didn't have to add anything to. They had no examples in them, and he couldn't explain anything. And he actually only taught me stuff I thought I knew. He was crap. He was the worst lecture I've ever okay, had in my well. life. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing it. <laughs> Thank you for sharing it. Um, Thank you for sharing it. 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 Thank you for before I continue with my section, I'm going to pass on to Sue, who then is just going to try discussing then the definition and the context of engagement. Okay, um, engagement, meaning, and importance. The one thing that we found out looking at student engagement is that learning actually begins with the student's engagement. Um, looking at the literature, there are a wide range of definitions, and it was quite difficult for us to pin down what we wanted to share with you today. But what we focused on was the importance of student engagement in terms of outcomes. So um, the three that we chose was around um, engagement is the degree to which learners are engaged with their educational activities, and that's positively linked to a host of desired outcomes, including high grades, student satisfactions, and perseverance, and that's uh, Chen et al. Uh, 2008. Um, therefore, the greater the student's involvement or engagement in <coughs> academic work um, or in the academic experience of the college, the greater his or her level of knowledge acquisition and general cognitive development. And I'm not going to try and that. Um, <laughs> therefore, um, student engagement is simply characterised as their participation in educationally effective practices and that's both inside and outside the classroom, which leads to a range of measurable outcomes which we've already described. Um, so looking at factors which can affect student engagement, we've already heard of some of them already today. Um, looking at reasons for student non-engagement, um, some of them are very obvious. Um, things around academic difficulties, really struggling in the classroom, adjustment difficulties, level of social maturity, which is something I would never have thought of until I was an 18 year old leaving home and going to university and found it very difficult. Um, unclear, narrow and changing goals, their weak and external commitment to uh, higher education and financial in, uh, inadequacies, um, lack of fit, and that can be either social or academic, and, and their isolation, their feelings of isolation, and we, we understand that that's particularly difficult for students in the first year. So that's reasons for non-student or student non-engagement, but then the, how do we overcome that and what are the drivers of student engagement? Um, again, we've heard some of these things today about academic integration, supporting the students to settle in, uh, having a challenging, rewarding and consistent goal set for students, which leads to better satisfaction, uh, commitment to higher education, sufficient finance, or well, we all like that, um, feeling of fitting in, and having friends and being known, which is really important to students. 
So looking at, at that then, student engagement drawing this, the first one is challenging, rewarding, and consistent goals, which you've already mentioned, which links into employee engagement drivers of job satisfaction and academic integration. And integration, academic, social, and fitting in, having friends, and being known equates to feeling valued and being involved in the workplace and social integration. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand you over to Paul now. I'm going to talk about the policy background to all of this. So moving on, the policy background. Uh, as I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear, this is the tip of the iceberg in a policy perspective. And just to give you a taste of it, there's uh, engage, student engagement in the big picture relates to a, a vast amount of government uh, direct directives with relation to higher education. Engagement is inextricably linked with uh, government retention guidelines. So there's a very, very clear link between student engagement and, how, and their persistence with higher education. The government thinks that it would be a good thing if students stay on the courses that they actually choose to stay. Uh, in addition to that, then, that can be broken down into the fact that student retention, the, the the issue areas or the problem areas tend to be in less advantaged groups. So the key social benefit of enhancing student engagement is the social, the positive, positive social impact that engaged students have in as much as that they tend to be more likely to persist with their studies. So that's on a national uh, level. On a professional level, we have uh, UKHEA, our professional body, <clears throat> they have guidance on retention and success of piece of research uh, published by them and commissioned by them, Thomas 2012, which deals with this in a lot of detail. So this is part of our professional standards in effect, but also uh, the, its professional policy are these issues associated with uh, student engagement. In terms of UK professional standards framework, rather than just uh, policy, uh, Engagement can be linked to pretty much any, anyone that you choose, but some examples of that are teaching support learning. So our role as not only a policeman within the teaching environment, but how can we actually improve student engagement? Similarly, assessing and giving feedback. Once again, if you want to engage students, then we have a key role in this. So increasingly we're seeing the picture that it's not them, it's about us. Us as in not only teachers, but us as a group of people within a classroom. The, the students and ourselves being one unit. How can we work together to enhance the level of engagement as a team? Uh, respect learners. Once again, a fundamental issue we'll be touching on later. If you don't respect learners, then this is a massive engagement error. So we'll be promoting participation and quality of opportunity, and also acknowledging the wider context and implications of professional practice. Students, in some pieces of research, it's reported that some students just don't know how to engage. So we have a role in helping students to develop those skills. And those are skills which then they'll take on into the workplace and into society as a whole. Uh, from an institutional perspective, you won't be surprised to hear that there are <coughs> one or two pieces of policy from Brooks. Uh, we have the strategy for enhancing the student experience. <coughs> Core to that is uh, our issues of engagement. Similarly, graduate attributes, academic literacy, fundamental to that is students being able to engage and remain, remain engaged. Critical self-awareness and global citizenship, once again, this is a key skill which students, if they, have, if they don't have it, can acquire, and we're fundamental in delivering that. In terms of benchmarking, how we're judged, well, we're all only too well aware we've got the National Student Survey. This is a discussion that, in the US, this has moved to a survey of student engagement rather than in the style that it's done in this country. So when we have module evaluation and review, this is a judge of how we're performing in terms of generating student engagement. Similarly, Brooks Student Retention KPR, so the number of students that are moving off your courses to do other things, be that staying in higher education or just going to the workplace. Uh, these, are metri these are metrics of how successful we're being in encouraging students to be engaged. Uh, so next is, and then in addition to this, uh, in terms of stimulating uh, our students' engagements, while it's not an official, uh, or maybe it seems seem like an oblique way of interpreting the concept of policy, we also 
should be careful not to lose sight of the marketing messages that the university is putting out there. So what are students' expectations when they come to this university? And the one that is repeated again and again and again is the most important reason, reason for choosing Brooks is the quality of our teaching. Teaching methods, our strong teaching is rooted in first-rate research. Uh, over, and then once again, teaching excellence. So as uh, teaching professionals within the organisation, I think it's important to remember that we have a fundamental role in enhancing uh, student engagement. Uh, so while there may be factors outside of our control, the thing that we thought would be helpful for us to do today was to focus on the things that we can actually influence. Uh, so now I'll pass on to show you. So now we're going to discuss a little bit about engagement theory. So any ideas what engagement theories are about? Anything? <laughs> 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 Say that again? Theories about engagement. The hell? Well, the theory behind why people engage. Well, part of it is, is the why, but it's also looking at different dimensions, if you will, as well, uh, of engagement. So I won't have the time to expand on, on you know, the details of each one of them. But as you can see, there's sort of five main theories of engagement. If you are interested in, uh, in looking a bit more, understanding a bit more of the theories of engagement, I do suggest you have a look at the sources that I've provided there. Uh, Kahoo 2013 is actually one of the pre-activities, so you can actually find that in the forum. Uh, but if we look at, for example, the effective theory of engagement, uh, the main research area here is really focusing on students, for example, uh, level of interest, of enjoyment, um, of happiness, of boredom, even of anxiety when actually they embrace uh, an academic activity. And interestingly, one of the main findings is actually that a student's uh, feelings and emotional attachments actually really do matter. And students who are actually um, have emotional connections with people or school uh, are actually better able to pursue and complete academic tasks. Uh, behavioral uh, is really what more uh, today's presentation is about because of, of what we're doing today, really maximizing student engagement uh, in the classroom because it focuses particularly on that, on student behavior and the teaching practice. Um, the psychological actually, here engagement is actually viewed as an internal individual process. Um, that obviously it's malleable, so it's good for us because we know that there's something that can be done there. Um, and of course it also gets an amalgamation of other uh, dimensions of engagement, which is the affective and the behavioral. Um, and of course then the socio-cultural, the really just focuses on, on the critical and important role that the broader social context has on um, students' experience <coughs> and engagement. Um, and then we have the holistic, which is really what um, Lately, they're trying to do to really wrap these different elements together and see uh, engagement as you know a mixture of all these elements rather than just uh, in a dimension of it. So, uh, if we look at this one, for example, obviously different authors have uh, given a different stance of holistic engagement theory. Uh, but Kahoo 2013 actually provides a, a nice framework made out of six elements, as you can see. So, of course, there's the structural and the psychosocial influence of both the university, the students, and different elements that each one bring, and of course, the relationship. Um, it has students at its center, and then that's when we start seeing sort of the different strands of the previous engagement theory. So, you have the sociocultural influence, which quite nicely embraces the entire framework. Uh, but then you also have the affection, uh, which was again previously the cognition, psychological. Um, and the behavior. Um, again, I put that just in red because, again, that's really what today's presentation focuses on is really on the teaching practice. Even though, of course, we, we are aiming more um, for a holistic engagement theory uh, because, as we can see from the double sided arrows, really engagement is not just seen as a result of one of these elements, but really as an amalgamation of all of these uh, playing together. Uh, and of course, very important is that as engagement, of course, you get the proximal and the distal consequences. You get, of course, the, the obvious one that we can all think of the academic, you know, the content learning. But really, with engagement, I think that the importance of this holistic engagement theory is that there's a lot more uh, outcomes of engagement rather than just academic. And those, of course, can be social, linked to what Paul was actually talking about the global attributes, for example, of Brooks. Uh, to global citizenship, personal growth. So there's a lot more to engagement than, again, than just an academic. So um, that's um, important. I'm going to pass you now to uh, Paul, who's going to then uh, bring you to the teaching techniques then uh, to increase engagement. Thank you. Uh, so the, the hope is that this, this whole session will deliver something that is of value to us as uh, participants in this, on this course. Uh, certainly, as a member of my group, I've, I've learned a huge amount and put some of these uh, examples into practice already and they seem to have improved student engagement. So there are great opportunities 
not only for, for using these in the classroom for the students' benefit, but, but a, a key feature within that, I find, is that as the students become more, more engaged, I become more engaged as well. So rather than trying to avoid that or getting involved in a negative spiral of, of, of policing students, uh, if we can try and have the opposite impact of trying to create a positive reinforcement by us engaging students who then may actually engage ourselves more, then, then we may end up with a more enjoyable uh, learning experience and almost as importantly, more enjoyable teaching experience as well. Uh, some things that, that we might want to consider making use of, and I encourage you to maybe note down examples that you think you might be able to use yourself, because we will be asking questions later, uh, is uh, uh, one, one option is active learning. So engaging students in problem or practice-based learning, drawing on examples and real-world applicability. We uh, surely touched on, on uh, proximal and distal distal uh, benefits, so proximal meaning short-term, distal meaning long-term, so proximal could be getting through your assessment, but linking your activities uh, as, a, as a teacher and as students to uh, students, for example, not only to their academic outcomes, but also to uh, their potential employability in terms of how they interview, and also then to their professional practice and their just future quality of life. Uh, the impression I get is that that's a very powerful message to deliver to students and that it really does seem to get attention. Similarly, problem-based learning used for assessment helps engagement because students can really see the relevance of what you're doing. <coughs> Student-led seminars, once again, if students are allowed to take ownership, then the suggestion is that this helps them to engage with what it is that they're doing. <coughs> Collaborative learning and small group teaching, well, we've seen that there are positives potentially and negatives to that with the group that went ahead of us. But the hope is that by using collaborative learning, then you're going to get a deeper level of understanding, but also a greater level of engagement rather than just sitting uh, uh, just uh, in the room without fully engaging in what's being considered. Staff-student relationships will come on to later. This is a key, key, key factor that comes up again and again in the research. Uh, group work, well, there are loads of opportunities for just breaking out of the regular habits. Uh, I think a lot of us already do a lot of these things in our teaching, but it's important not to lose sight of the benefits of things like poster tours, where students produce something, and then the other students come around and, and, uh, and, and view those and appreciate this, those posters. Similarly, pyramids, rounds, syndicates, fishbowls, these are different <coughs> opportunities for enhancing student engagement. A fishbowl bowl, for example, is where you have a group of students sitting in a circle, engaging in a discussion, and then another group round the outside of them. And these students can swap positions within, the, within, within that teaching setting. So it encourages some students to engage particularly deeply because they're the ones in the focus, and then the others need to stay focused so that they can then slip in and continue the, the discussion. Certainly encouraging students to take responsibility once again, rather than feeling that they are the uh, passengers within on a journey, encouraging them to take responsibility for that journey and the route that it takes helps them to feel a sense of ownership and so improve engagement. Uh, enthusiastic and knowledgeable lecturers, well, there you go. We're told that it's fine for us not to know what we're teaching, but the research suggests that actually, if you've got a knowledgeable lecturer, then there is a sort of a glow effect to that. And the students appreciate that. Who says it's like... fine not to know what you're doing? So, <laughs> well, no, I think there's, there's a suggestion that, that it's fine to say to the students, you know, we're on the, this journey together, and when you're maybe supervising seminars. The research questions that, uh, but I think it depends maybe how you do it. Uh, but certainly enthusiastic as well. Uh, we've all had difficult times, bad days, but this does have an impact. So if we can put that happy face on when we walk into the teacher room, then the suggestion is that that helps the students to engage fully. Uh, and offering a diverse learning experience, so incorporating busy video and regular peer and self-evaluation once again. So just keeping it interesting, that's another element of optimising uh, student engagement, as is using a virtual learning environment, which I think we're all very conversant with now. Uh, so if we start to consider the merits and challenges of what it is that we're discussing here today, well, active learning, uh, it, is, it, 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 it suggests that it'll uh, 
deliver high engagement, pragmatic skills, uh, and uh, be very helpful. But getting people engaged, you might, might end up with a burnout from this process. Uh, similarly, collaborative learning. Uh, this involves uh, working together to develop an understanding. And uh, sharing these learning experiences is very good from, in terms of developing a deep understanding, but also in terms of developing uh, these activities or these skills that would be beneficial to uh, students in the workplace. Uh, but there are dangers associated with that, those being maybe some of our the groups in this room have experienced difficulty with performing the group work tasks that we're, we're delivering today. Uh, so you can get group work conflicts and people who may be very, very motivated students may feel that it's unfair to have their marks pulled down by being in a group where they're, they're, out, they're with less motivated uh, students. Some of the enthusiastic and knowledgeable lecturers, well, there's a this link to, to active and collaborative learning and shared responsibility, but uh, it can be difficult as lecturers if we're uh, having a difficult time, maybe, or the students aren't as engaged as we'd like them to be, then they're trying to re-energize those as students can be a very difficult task, especially when there are competing uh, calls on the students' time and they may be not get, you're not, you may be not getting the level of attendance that you would hate for. Uh, diverse and, a, a range of diverse learning experience. Uh, it's great to have, have some variety, but changing things does involve an element of risk as well. So if, if we are changing or trying new things, then there's a possibility that something might not work, which can always uh, be a little bit worrying if we've got a module that's worked well for the last few years. But we're living in an evolving environment, evolving environment from a social and technological perspective. And if we don't engage in that, then there's a, a chance that we're going to lose uh, contact with those people who, who find that second nature. So there's also no guarantee that these techniques will work. And that, that could be uh, disappointing if we put a lot of effort into re uh, a, a module and then we find that actually it's not going as well as the year before. But I think it's important to, to test new things. Going back to what we were saying earlier on, to my mind, uh, the main learning outcome for me as, as someone who does some teaching is the fact that the most important thing is, is how we are as people and how we interact with the students. Uh, and this is uh, reinforced by uh, research on the subject. Uh, typically, Thomas 2012, which was published by the UKHER, so in effect, this forms policy. Uh, that it's important to, to know the students as individuals and treat students as individuals rather than just as a, a, a group. Uh, and to appear interested in the students uh, and to be available and respond. So that it's not just a case of students coming to see us when they've got a problem, but encourage the students to let us know what's going well. Uh, I suggested to this to my students, they looked a little threatened for a while and then they seem to be getting a, a little bit of feedback that things, things are going fine. Uh, so, to summarise, students uh, want relationships with staff that are less formal, more like a mentor rather than a uh, traditional teacher. Okay, it's over to me now. Um, second activity, uh, reflections for future practice. What we'd like to do in these tables is to consider one practice that you've heard of today that you think that will change uh, or which you would want to incorporate in your future teaching uh, in order to engage your students. Consider why you think want to approach that and then we'll come back and we don't share any ideas. Yeah, 